Chapter 1. Blue Haze A steely blue haze hangs over Miami, one that will only shift when the sun forces it away. The lack of light from the dead concrete city fails to make the impression on nature it would have just five years earlier. It may well be an enjoyable time to be out running, and exercise is allowed within the restrictions, but it's a long time since Dwight ran anywhere. His converted double-cab truck is left behind him alone in the square to leave the parking in front free for customers. That's a habit he had no need to keep today. He powers around the corner, avoiding the potholes. His ear is lit by the glow of his cell phone wedged by his shoulder. It is so quiet, the whole derelict square of the 1960s units might have heard the conversation, if there was anyone to listen. If you could solve it, you wouldn't be ringing a black man in a wheelchair for help, Dwight says, knowing he has the upper hand. It's a theft. That should be at a basic rate, says the formal female voice that he is negotiating with, coming by his speaker. From his powered chair, he fondles with a bunch of old keys that defy technology. One will open the door, recessed in the entranceway to the diner, only a designer could waste such space, he thinks, his large machine awkward to manoeuvre in the alcove. The bigger problem is what you're not telling me. It always is, which is why you're ringing our agency, and why we have our fees, and why we dictate the number of agents. Plus, there's an extra $1,000 bullet money. The door has not been opened for weeks, yet Wild Mary's Diner is still intact. Unlike a few shops that have been looted in the lockdown, there is nothing of value here. No stock and nothing to sell for quick cash. Though cash is becoming less and less useful. Food is a commodity in this third phase of lockdown. But the stock that was in the kitchen got split and moved home weeks ago. Mary and Stan had a chunk. But their kids, who now share the apartment Mary bought them, had what remained. They are all 20 years old, and burgers won't have lasted long. Bullet money? $1,000 for every bullet fired at any of our agents. But that shouldn't worry you, Dwight fires at her. Why not? If it's an easy job like you say, no one's gonna shoot at them. Dwight won't get breakfast. He can't smell the grill. He can't hear the daily concert of Stan's songs, the ones he's been singing since his days of touring music theatres, from Pensacola to the pier at Cocoa Beach, along Florida's Emerald Coast. Stan's journey might have ended at any of the state's 12 coasts. Dwight could have sat down anywhere in the USA, but they both struck gold here. Them's the terms. Now we got that out the way, why are you really ringing us? No one at CSI knows much about Dwight. But during the art theft, he added two freelance agents to the workforce. Ex-soldiers from his old unit. Their calm helped avoid a near full-blown shootout on the pier in what many still call Indian River City. After that job successfully wrapped up, the new mixture of agents found much to talk about. Cruise ship crime investigators' own agents, Kieran and Hunter, found out a lot more about Dwight Ritter. The jeweler's safe has been opened. It was emptied yesterday afternoon or overnight, but before 7am, diamonds worth way over a quarter of a million. Maybe half a million will have gone. Can't the ship's security deal with that? Dwight asks. They don't know it's happened, the woman says. Dwight pulls up sharply, the remark stopping him in his tracks. He remains planted, looking at the small plaque, cruise ship crime investigators, on the otherwise innocent black cupboard door on the side wall of the diner. It hides a steel door into their secure unit, just four feet behind it. How do you know back at your head office before the crew do at sea? Dwight asks, typing diamond heist into his cell phone to update all staff. Now he knows this is a job for the agency. 
He smells dangerous rats on that ship. A whistleblower, he hears. So we had the choice of calling the ship's security to discuss it, or, in case they were in on it, calling you, while no one else knows we know. See, it ain't ever easy. That's why people ring, CSCI. My team will be on the ship before it gets dark. Keep the cost at a team of just two. I'll keep you informed as the cost rises. And it will. Two won't work. We start with four. I want the purchase order here by the time I finish my coffee, Dwight insists. The glow goes out as the call ends. Finish my coffee. Dwight laughs to himself, looking at the lifeless grill. Starting a mug of coffee would be nice. Beyond, in the preparation room, the refrigeration doors hang open to air. Despite the lack of breakfast, he decides to stop at his usual table by the opening in the counter. The bag slung over his shoulder is thrown onto his table. All the other tables sit between two traditional red and cream Art Deco bench seats. But here, at the end, one bench has been removed for a mobility chair. It's been that way since Dwight became a fixture. And Dwight has been on wheels since he jumped on an IED, whilst leading his men from the front. It never hurt at the time, but he knew his legs were gone. Maybe one of his team had hit him with morphine. But the mind and the body do strange things in trauma, even without drugs. His mind still does. His team got him back, and he owes Billy and Zack his life. They will get called when CSCI need extra agents. But this is not one of those jobs. Not yet. However, cruise ship crime investigators never get called for the easy operations. They get high-stakes, complicated crimes to unravel because they not only know the industry, they know how publicity can turn bad. Social media is so fast, there is often no time to refer to head office. CSCI know cruising and are trusted to make quick decisions. Dwight's cell phone is on the surface, ringing out. A deep female voice answers with a muffled Eastern European one-word drone. Nothing recognisable. Betty, get your ass in the office, girl, and read your texts on the way. Dwight instructs. He doesn't want a conversation, and he doesn't want to give her the chance to say no. She is still grieving. Work will be good for her. He spins his chair and hits the cell to end the call. Before any of these lockdowns, Dwight was considering the world-class prosthetic limb centre in uptown Miami. It had taken a lot of targeted banter for him to rise above self-imposed barriers. Fighting to walk again is not only a physical torture, but an explosion of his post-traumatic stress. He may have commanded a major military special ops unit and now be the quick-thinking CSCI point man and head their technical hub, but he conceals his own dark periods. He doesn't have time for those thoughts. He makes another call. Crock, send a one-stage contract. Details to you on a text. I'm going to need a plane. Stand by on that. Dwight hears the door open, and Kieran Phillips arrives in the diner. He was a commander too, in the same war zones, he is very British, originally from a tank regiment, but since spent many years working deep cover behind enemy lines. Exactly the type of operator Dwight's unit was sent in to get out when everything went tits up, as Kieran would say. Women especially love Kieran's posh British accent that draws the listener in. However, they have all been locked down again for ages and seen no one. Phillips, reporting for duty, Commander Dwight Ritter, sir? Kieran says formally as he drags a finger along the table for dust. He is pleased there is extraordinarily little dirt, considering the place has been closed for at least six weeks. Cars, planes and ships have all been grounded, due to the latest D-variant of the virus entering the country. 
so there has been little pollution again. Stand down, Phillips, and stick this up your nose, Kieran. The amusing pizzicato banter is back. Do I tell him Kieran Phillips to stand at ease when he is outranked here, in the business, and by past military rank? Kieran is his boss. Are we not going next door? Kieran asks, pointing at the innocent black door that was once a utilities cupboard. Dwight ignores him, tossing COVID test packs onto two of the dining tables away from him. Wild Mary smashed a hole in the wall between the units to mend a leaking pipe. The hole got filled by a reinforced wall and a steel door as they moved in and built a high-tech hub. Now, using the broom cupboard as an entrance to their unit has become a habit. Even though they park around the corner in the shopping centre that closed long before the pandemic, they all walk past their own street door, past the corner of the diner, and around to the front of the attached unit. The restaurant has both aspects from front and side. The L-shaped diner has become home. Mary and the kids have all become essential parts of the extended investigation team who all want to get onto the cruise ship every time CSCI have a contract. However, no one will race to volunteer this time. These ships are locked down and going nowhere. They have no guests, so we'll feel like soulless floating tin prison ships. Maybe that is why someone, or a small team, think the valuable gem safes on board are easy pickings. Yo, Hunter says as he swings the door open and the tiny bell above it rings for the third time. His entrance is louder and less formal than KP's. He sees Kieran at a table by himself reading the instructions to the sterile pack. Won't they do that at the airport? I send them the tests done in the last 12 hours, Dwight says. He is in charge of CSCI, although it's owned by the two men before him, Commander Kieran Phillips and Hunter Witowski of undisclosed military rank. There's a system right for abuse, Hunter offers, stating the obvious flaw in the structure. You'll be shipping out today, Dwight says. What's the rush? Kieran asks. Not that he's objecting. He doesn't have a wife and a new baby like Hunter. We need to be all over that ship before it gets around there's been a robbery, Dwight explains. No one knows. We'll keep it secret while we're investigating then, Kieran says sarcastically. The two powerful men sit and wince at the uncomfortable deep swabbing of their noses, then wait for the flow test results. Dwight is on the phone, organising transport. It is remarkably quick and easy for him. Hunter has his cell phone to his ear, but while waiting for a reply, he is watching Dwight. You're not open in the hub, or we're not allowed in till we pass, Hunter asks when Dwight finishes his call. I thought this job might be easy enough for me to run from home, Dwight says. Home? Kieran questions. This is your home, Hunter says, still waiting for someone to pick up his call and the test result to appear. I got my friends. Both men look at Dwight in surprise, then almost in harmony, though with different accents say, you don't, don't have, have any friends. friends. Me and the Amazon delivery guy have got real close. And I've built a state-of-the-art gaming console. I'm making more friends there. They both continue to look at him in amazement, wanting answers. My chair moves and shakes while I'm piloting a spaceship. World moves. It all moves with me. They study him in silence. I'm in a team. Same people every day, Dwight says. Made some good friends. Avatars, Hunter states, as he throws his test slide at him. They ain't real people. An avatar says more about a person than their name, because they chose it. They're free to wear it. Pardon, Kieran says. You want to run this mission from your avatar-infested home of surreal guests who could be our diamond thieves in disguise. 
or perverts or underage girls, Hunter suggests. No, no, sorry, Elaine. That was to Dwight, he says, focusing back on his cell and addressing his call. I gotta fly out and search a ship. Might be gone overnight. I'll call you when I know more. Love ya. What's your handle? Karen asked Dwight. They're not cold handles. I bet it's got legs, Hunter digs. He and Kieran have been mercilessly pushing him to walk again. Look, guys, mobility is under consideration. I'm looking into it, Dwight concedes. How many legs has your avatar got? Eight. My name's Spider, and spiders always have eight legs. And how many do you need? Two, Hunter. I'm going to have two legs made, and you're paying. We'll pay every damn nickel, Hunter drills. This eight-legged avatar, male or female? Kieran asks. It's not male or female. I worry about you, Dwight. You have so many life decisions to make, Hunter says, rising to look over the counter to see nothing. No food, no coffee. Why are we in here? We got coffee machine next door. You need to get to the airport. What airport? Might be up coast, I don't know yet, but you will be leaving, and I do have a female friend, Dwight states. Seriously, where is our information support? Kieran inquires, looking at the closed door. Look, I could run it from on ship, Dwight says. It's a better idea than Toy Town, Hunter jumps in. But no, Dwight insists. My opportunity to cruise will be wasted on a dead ship. Then I'll be bottom of that stack to cruise again. A woman? Did you slip in? You and a woman? Kieran poses, wanting to know more. Dwight smiles, but there is no answer. Well, you found yourself a dame? Does she know that you're... A Hunter starts. What, that I'm in a chair? Yes. No, that you're fat. You put on a hundred pounds, Hunter teases. That's the thing about an avatar. She doesn't know that, and I'm cutting back, Dwight says. So she doesn't know you, and you don't know her, Kieran attacks. I see her every day. But you don't, Hunter drills. It's a trust thing. We explore worlds together, fight side by side. Like being in a unit. But it's not, is it? What's the name of this avatar? I want to meet her before she dates my boy. I want to vet her, Hunter says. Rocket. Rocket? That's all you got? You don't need much more to be a friend. We click just like that, Dwight snaps his fingers. So you want to live in your bedroom now? Hunter teases. With an avatar. Kieran adds. Here's how it will go. They'll feel bad, you'll help them with advice, become real close, then wham. They'll need money for their puppy or child or whatever, Hunter explains. No, Dwight insists. Truth is, you just don't want to be face to face with a bunch of killers out there at sea, Kieran retorts. It's sharp lifting. No one's getting killed. Dwight says. It's diamonds, Hunter insists. They call them blood diamonds because people die for them. How much are these diamonds worth? Kieran asks. Quarter of a million dollars, Dwight reveals. Just across the I-95 in Overtown, people get killed for a fraction of that money, Hunter adds. I know. I've advised the client of the bullet money clause. Bullet money, they both pull up in harmony. It's that new clause for extras based on you being shot at, Dwight informs them innocently. It's a clever clause that Izzy came up with. How do we know how many bullets, Hunter says, at the lunacy of the clause. Count them, Dwight insists, straight-faced. Then forward me the inventory, with the times and the places. Sure, and we need a clause for being killed, 
anyone who steals that value of diamonds is a potential killer. Kieran fires at Dwight. Sure, that's why head office hasn't even told the resident security. Both men shoot a puzzled look at Dwight. Who's going to ring my wife and tell her it might be longer than one night? Hunter growls, thinking. The exchange has made them all realize that they are on another kill or be killed mission, just like when conscripted. These missions all add to their PTSD, and none of them talk about it. <laughs>